okay. Trying to go. And I'll do one. Ah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Right, well we've got two interesting cards here. Two gods have turned up. We've got Perun again, who was the Russian Slavic god. And so kind of important, relevant to the Putin saga that I've been talking about. Russia hovering over the edge of Europe. <clears throat> Doesn't quite know what to do with its energy, so it's gone to war. So Perun, I mean, I appeal to my Russian esoteric thinkers out there to rein in the Perun energy of the, the lads of Russia um, because it's dangerous especially when you start realising that you know nuclear weapons could be involved. What I think is so wrong about Russia's invasion of Ukraine is Ukraine got rid of all its nuclear weapons it surrendered them mm. we thought back in 1991 when it did that, that the world was going in a non-nuclear direction I was coordinator of Philosophers of Peace. I was elected in Moscow. My Russian friends wouldn't have dreamed that there'd be this taxi driver from St. Petersburg launching a private war against Ukraine in the name of neo-fascism. You know, these people were, were intellectuals who were friends with Gorbachev, and they were social democrats. They wanted a new form of Russia that was living in peace. And um, <clears throat> knowledge about Perun is interesting because he was... He was the Slavic Russian deity, and he stands for, um, in the Tarot of the Gods, he's in the Major Arcana, which is in Volume 1, um, in the text. And um, he seems to be from an etymology, meaning the origin, the first, the most high. Um, the name is found also in Baltic mythology as Perkunas. So Perun was the highest god of the Slavic pantheon, the god of the sky, of thunder, of lightning, and of storms. So he's quite similar to Tyrannus. Um, yeah. As you say, it's a god of Slavic people. Yeah. May we consider he's a, a god for Ukrainian people as well? Well, this is it, absolutely. Mm. Yes, yes. All the Slavic people. Mm worshipped Perun. And also um, some pagan friends of mine in Slovenia where I've been to give talks about Druids and meeting Slavic pagans. In, um, and in Croatia there's a Perun festival every summer. There's a Perun festival in honour of, of this god where they have like a market stall. People bring their things. They play music. They dance. They have a bonfire. I think that takes place in Croatia which is a Slavic culture. So it, it's not exclusively Russian. <clears throat> um, I'd say the Russians have, you know, hyper-actualized the warlike nature because Perun is also the strong masculine who will come to protect the people and is the warrior god for the Slavs. But um, you don't do killing of innocents. You don't go and kill uh, little old grannies living in Ukraine and shelling their houses and stuff. He's, no, he's the fertility god, and he's the god of oak trees. So as a druid, you know, he's very similar to our god um, in, in that respect. Um, and the druids love their oak trees and, and the mistletoe and all that. So, so I think the Russian um, esoteric pagans have mistaken that whole tradition as one of war instead of one of peace. And this is, this is a problem. When male, particularly male um, energy gets, gets, you know, funneled into an aggressive um, track, as happened to, to Putin, I think, as a young man. I'm sure his soul was not like that from the beginning, but he, he became quite violent quite early on. And in the KGB, they train you to be very, very violent and to bear pain and, you know, and, and to be merciless with your enemies. Um, <clears throat> and I think this is this is wrong. These people need to be um, rehabilitated back into civil society, if you want. Um, so anyway, the the uh, there's a human sacrifice element to this in that in the dark days of 
Purun worship, some people thought that the best way to assuage the god is to do human sacrifice. And Stravinsky's famous rite of spring is about a human sacrifice to Perun, um, which is based on historical um, precedents. And um, <clears throat> it's thought that um, Vladimir I, uh, who became a Christian, did a human sacrifice to a Vi um, in Kiev as a living sacrifice to Perun when he was still a pagan. So Vladimir, Mr. Putin's namesake, thought it was fine to do human sacrifice to this god. But then he became a Christian and repented of it. Um, but, but deep down there's a sort of, there's a sacrificial thing about Perun that we need to unthink. You know, it's said that the Druids used to do human sacrifice as well, and that's a scary story told to children. But that's why the Druids became Christians in the British Isles and in Gaul. We accepted Christianity as, as the final sacrifice. We don't need to keep doing that anymore. Um, enough is enough. And we don't need to keep doing warfare and violence. So we should accept, you know, Christ's sacrifice for all of us in love, which then means that we don't have to keep doing that and killing each other. Um, so that was the Druid take on it. And I think it's like, I think that's what the Russians realized, why they became Christian. But they seem to have slipped somewhere. Something fell out of the, um, the thought process since I was last in Russia in 93. And Putin doesn't seem to realize this. He's gone down a very funny rabbit hole of of bringing back Peran worship as a sort of violent thing. Um, and that's totally wrong. His wife was Mokosh, by the way. She was a fertility mother goddess. And she wants everyone to get along and, you know, um, live with nature, the fruits of the earth, together. Um, so I, I, I've met some very brilliant Russian intellectuals and philosophers, and I would appeal to them to to understand the wisdom of, of these ancient Slavic roots, but to realize the kind of, um, the higher level, the higher vibration of that, which is non-violent. And I've met Russian intellectuals in India, for instance, who've come to some of our non-violence conferences, who real and Tolstoy was one of the great teachers of non-violence. He realized all this. Um, that's the tradition of Russian thought that I'd like to see reactivated properly. Um, and I know there are people in Ukraine also working with this. Um, yes, so that's Perun. Okay, um, <clears throat> now the other card, the one I got, is number 19, who's the sun god, Inti, um, also a major arcana. And he stands for the card of the sun. And he's from Peru, Latin American religion. Um, and he is on the flag of many Latin American nations um, as the sun. He was really important. <clears throat> like to all pagan cultures around the world, uh, the sun is pretty, pretty important. And the, the physics of the sun are incredible. Um, I'm in awe of the sun. I was out there today doing some sun worship. Um, every, every photon that hits the Earth and that gets into through photosynthesis is captured by leaves, which makes our food and the animals' food. Each one of those photons has been in the sun for tens of thousands of years. It's created in the centre of the sun through fusion, when helium atoms come together. And, and then it, <clears throat> it's so crowded in there that it takes tens of thousands of years to get to the surface of the sun. Mm. It's like <clears throat> you could write a kind of novel about what it's like to be a photon and tell the story. Um, it, it's swirling around in these plasmic currents inside the sun along with other, loads of other photons and then occasionally one of them reaches the surface after thousands and thousands of years. It's extraordinary. And then it only takes, I think, nine minutes or six minutes to reach the Earth's surface, having escaped from the sun, 
when it then lands up in a leaf and it ends up in your salad, you know, not long after. That story, I think, is incredible. Um, and without that, there'd be no life on this planet. Every move we make energetically, every time I wave a finger, that's solar energy. That's the food I've digested, which is powering the cells. And that's come from the sun. So we're like children of the sun, all of us here on this planet. Every animal, every tree, every, um, every living being. And what the Peruvians said, what the Incans said, is therefore we should worship Inti, who's the sun god, the creator. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of wisdom in this. Uh, he was married to the moon goddess, who is also very sacred, uh, Mama Kila. And they were, they were loved by the Incan people, who were very intelligent, I think. And, um, you know, they, they, were, um, they had lots of myths and legends about the theology of all this, which are recorded. Um, they also felt that um, there was a goddess of the rainbow and the Pleiades and Venus. So they, they believe the divine intelligence behind the universe, which manifests as the sun, also manifests as, as these other planets. Um, <clears throat> and of course, that's why they loved gold. The Incans loved gold because it was, they saw it as like crystallized salt sun energy. So it was sacred. They didn't think of it something to buy and, and um, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't money. It symbolized, it was the wealth of beauty. Um, I wonder if Louis XIV and his yeah. son King, uh, he, he had this solar disc that was his symbol. And this film that I recommend called Versailles, um, which is brilliantly filmed and shot in Versailles, they got permission to make the film fair, tells the whole inner story of the court of Louis XIV. Um, and they invented ballet and um, they were doing all kinds of interesting intellectual work. Um, Louis was sending Jesuits off to China and was, was an intellectual in his own right. There was the, um, you know, the French in Paris were establishing, um, you know, the Académie Française and so on. So I don't know. I think he, he identified himself with Apollo, the sun king that Louis worshipped was Apollo. But he would have, he would have known of the Latin American love of, of the sun. And I'm sure there were French scholars who knew about Inti. Um, and in fact, many years later, um, there was a famous Peruvian woman who came to Paris and she was a socialist. She was a descendant of the Incan kings and queens um, with an obscure name that slipped me at the moment. But she was an esoteric thinker, a feminist, and she, was, she, she knew, she moved in the same circles as a lot of émigré um, thinkers, including Karl Marx, who met her. She was the one who coined the phrase, women of the world unite, we have nothing to lose but our chains. She was a feminist. And Marx stole the phrase and turned it into workers of the world unite, we have nothing to lose but our chains. Um, and she was Gauguin's grandmother. So Gauguin, the painter, was a, was a descendant of this amazing Peruvian aristocrat. Um, so yes, there were Peruvians around in, in Paris. But whether they were there at the time of Louis XIV, you know, I don't know. They Possibly. It'd be interesting to research, actually. I'm sure the Peruvian embassy in Paris has done a history of famous Peruvians in Paris over the centuries. Um, and I know that Simon Bolivar, who, who was the great liberator of uh, Colombia and um, Peru as well, um, he spent time in Paris and was inspired by the revolutionary traditions of Bonaparte and joined the Freemasonic lodges and was a you know, full-on Republican um, devotee um, who then took those traditions to, to liberate in, in Latin America and worked with, um, you know, um, his colleagues were 
were often from the Incan and the other Latin American cultures. So, <clears throat> so I think the, we can choose the way of death and violence and, and toxic masculinity, that's what the cards are saying, and we can all become little neo-fascists and fighting each other and doing human sacrifice, or we can elevate that masculinity to a higher level and, and realise that we have to worship the light, the truth, the love and, and the divine unity, um, which is behind all the traditions, you know, the one light infuses all the table. Um, without the sun, there are no boxes. There's, there's no people, there's no life. So, so I think that's how I would read this. We, can, we need to reactivate that, um, you know, that, the, the beauty of light. And that was a theme that came up in the New Paradigm Explorers Conference today, it was about the nature of light. Um, an interesting phrase that Arabella Thais came up with, which is, dark matter, dark energy, for her, is just veiled light. Everything is made of light. And if we, but we don't yet know how that works. But what we think of as darkness is also light. It's just veiled light. So that's just something to think about and, and how we can, how our scientists can prove that or work with that. That's cutting edge stuff. <coughs> um, my, my theory is, is, which is a bit like hers, is that, is that the, the cosmic rays and vibrations that we see that cause gravity are uh, originating in star explosions, quasars and stuff. And when they get pumped out in all directions, simultaneously throughout space, that's what's causing gravity. Um, you know, so gravity is itself a form of light energy. Um, and there were, you know, that's a theory that's been around, but again, it hasn't been proved. Uh, we don't have the physics yet for it. Um, it's a different type of theory to Einstein's. But I, I follow this, and it was... Um, a French intellectual physicist in the 18th century that first started thinking along those lines. Um, and then Newton, you know, sort of um, <coughs> didn't, didn't accept that theory. Didn't, I'm not sure he even knew about it, actually. He didn't include it in his Principia Mathematica. Um, I'll dig it up and I'll share that next time, because um, that's, that's interesting. Okay, I think we'll finish there. Um, any final comments before I read my poem? Final? No? Okay, we'll do one last little poem. Um, because poetry is important. We shouldn't neglect the muses. Um, Here's a very early poem of mine, when I was just starting out on my career, modelled on Rambo. I was going to write some really great short poems and then die off, but I seem to have lived on. This was a poem called The Furious Resolve. This is in my teens. Um, <clears throat> yes, I dropped out of school early to become a poet. I didn't want to just become a normal, like, you know, school, university, marriage house, mortgage, car, yeah. job, you know, no, I wanted to find ultimate truth, and I decided that's poetry, um, and then philosophy, so, and here I am still, still at it, but this, this was an early poem, not knowing the truth, even sun dusts grass with patience, and the calm past waiting. Fragments penetrate the cut like sudden hatchets. Falling water, bird cries, glowing bracken, rising mist like steam. 
I hesitate to move or to disturb as I would hesitate to touch a lover in her sleeping hills for fear of waking them. Yet the heart's voltage charged me, make this dream, this unforgetting, this unreal awareness, this fire in the blue dawn hills, this furious resolve to live. Is it a kind of ecstasy? <laughs> or not, or more... Uh, it's, it's a very early poem, 1975. Yeah. Um, so it's just, you know, my, my youth was quite intense. Yeah. My father died when I was 17. Oh. I left school at the age of 15. I travelled around reading poetry. And um, I fell in love, you know. Um, and I had some interesting adventures, you know, um, <clears throat> which I've written about in my autobiography. And this poem is, is part of a cycle that I wrote at that time. Um, and I think it's, it's an affirmation of life, so it's an ecstasy. It's saying in spite of all the problems, we don't know the ultimate truth, but we can still live, yeah, you know. It's, the, it's about the life force. Um, I see the sun. <laughs> yeah, and the sun, it's, it's synchronistically, it's, you know, we don't know why the sun shines, but it's amazing, and it, it's beautiful. So let's celebrate it and let's live. You know, that's what I think that poem's about. So, and that's why I'm on the side of hope, love, optimism. In spite of everything, the sun will come tomorrow. <laughs> on a spare. Okay, let's... Uh, on va finir.